Good afternoon and welcome to the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy Careers in Monitoring and Evaluation series. Um, thank you to all the students who have come. I know today's a particularly hectic day. Thank you to the faculty who have squeezed, squeezed us into their schedule. And thank you to everyone who's joined us virtually from wherever they are in the world. About ten minutes, five minutes prior to when we started, we were topping over about 75 people joining in. And so we're delighted that you have opted to spend this hour with us talking about the critical issues around monitoring and evaluation. For our virtual participants, if you are having audio challenges, please use your chat function and we'll do our best to try and fix them. We also ask that you mute your microphone if you're virtual because it will create an echo. So please mute your microphone within the WebEx program. Today it's my privilege to welcome our speaker, <coughs> Dr. Indra Naidu, the director of UNDP's Independent Evaluation Office. I'll introduce our guest in a more fulsome manner, but first let me say a few words about the series that this talk is part of and the format that this will follow. My name is Cheyenne Sherbet Church, and I'm the head of an organization called BESA. And we work with partners to catalyze strategic change in issues of peace building, anti-corruption, rule of law. Most issues that you find in conflict and fragile affected states. And our work in many cases involves conducting evaluations as well as helping set up internal monitoring and evaluation systems with a whole range of partners ranging from the State Department to the IDRC in Canada to implementing actors. And about eight, nine years ago, it was from the basis of this experience that the Fletcher School reached out and asked if we would set up an evaluation stream of work here at the Fletcher School. And that stream of work contains a whole number of different elements, the core of which is a three-part course series. And we start with program design and monitoring and international development and peace building, from which we move to introduction to evaluation, and we conclude with a course called Advanced Evaluation and Learning in International Organizations. The first two courses try to focus on the audience of people who are going to go out and work for donors or work for implementing agencies as practitioners, donor officers, desk officers, and it adopts the ethos that design monitoring and evaluation should be integrated into the programming in this field. The third course changes gears a little bit and says, so you want to be a monitoring and evaluation professional and digs in what it's like to be internal within an agency, an M&E unit, as well as an external, independent, or within a company evaluator. The courses are highly practical, they're intensive, and they're really focused on the, on the nexus of theory and practice, where we try to learn the theory and understand the actuality and the practice and how we can do the best evaluative work possible. As a supplement to those courses, I host a, a career in m and &E series. And those speakers range from independent evaluators to senior program people, to internal evaluation professionals. And as the title suggests, the talks provide guidance on how to get a career in monitoring and evaluation. But they also talk about key issues in the evaluation field that one would need to know in order to be a profession in this field. And today we're particularly fortunate as our speaker is going to address some of both of the areas, emerging challenges in evaluation in UNDP and ways in which emerging evaluators can become a profession, a professional in this field. And Dr. Nadu is particularly well positioned to do this with his over 20 years experience in leading independent evaluation offices. He cut his evaluative teeth, so to speak, in South Africa, working in and working on, if you will, government from an evaluative perspective. And he has established and led a number of different evaluation offices within South Africa. He has been the director of UNDP's Independent Evalu Evaluation Office since 2012. And today we have the pleasure of receiving his insights on the future opportunities and challenges in evaluation in UNDP. Dr. Nadu will speak for about 50 to 20 minutes. After which, I'll look for you to discuss and type this in. And then we'll open the floor to questions. I'm just going to remind you for your participants to mute because we are having the pleasure of hearing you. Um, so I can ask the virtual participants to mute their microphone. Oh, I think we're muted. Thank you very much. <laughs> Again, for, we will, Dr. Nadu will speak for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then he has said that he is open to any and all questions and prefers a discussion, which is exactly what we like to hear. Um, and I know that we will be asking some probing and penetrating and valuative <laughs> questions. Um, I have full confidence in Dr. Nadu's ability to, to respond. For our vir virtual participants, 
We welcome your questions as well. Please chat them in, and then they will be asked in the room, and that way we can get around some of our audio technical um, issues. So virtual, please chat in your questions. Group, I look forward to hearing your evaluative questions and flexing a little evaluative muscle. And Dr. Nadeau, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking time off your lunch to come and listen to me. Um, it's always intimidating to talk to a group of evaluators, <laughs> because you yourself are being evaluated. <laughs> but um, we'll sort of keep it lighthearted, and I'll go through quite a few issues. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. Thank you so much for this invitation uh, to, uh, to, to the organizers. And I've learned a lot about the Fletcher School, and I've been highly impressed. The work that you do resonates very much with the work that we do, and I think we're on the same mission to a marked extent. So, uh, Cheyenne uh, Church, uh, it's an absolute uh, you know, pleasure to be spending some time here in, in Boston. Um, I will speak to you wearing two hats today. One is as the director of the Independent Evaluation Office of UNDP, which is the largest evaluation office in the United Nations system. And secondly, uh, talking also as an evaluator. Uh, most of my professional experience has been in the conduct, design, and uh, of evaluations in various contexts, the evaluation of governance, uh, and of course, more recently, the evaluation of the development program of the UNDP. And at the end, I'd be happy to take, uh, take any questions. If I could just... My guess is your, your arrow keys will also work. Okay. Okay, fine. Um, to start off with, in, in terms of disengagement and our mission as evaluators, uh, as I mentioned, I value the partnership with the Fletcher School uh, of Tufts University, and we look forward to ongoing collaboration, which I'll talk to towards the end. And today we need to reflect on the question of how can evaluation be a catalyst for meaningful change? Because the key question that will be asked of us when we do evaluation, how do you know you are making a difference? In other words, who evaluates the evaluator to know whether you're really adding any value to the profession that you, you, uh, you hold? And I also wish to make the point that while methods are the key for credibility and utility, they serve a larger goal, which is to challenge institutional and political boundaries for dem democratic change to bring about progress. In other words, we need to understand the technical, but move beyond the technical. It's there to serve a broader purpose. And that will put you into the domain where it does become quite uh, challenging, because you are now meeting uh, people who have invested a lot of their lives in uh, pursuing a certain... Uh, agenda in, 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 in creating a certain image of what it is and you are coming now and asking for the evidence. Of course this is Evalia. It's significant because it's the first time that we've had a standalone UN resolution on evaluation and there's events, thousands that are happening across the globe to celebrate this and this is one of the first that the UNDP IEO is actually engaging in. And what that means is as a profession you are getting uh, recognized globally. So it's moving from the, from the margins to, to much more central. And it becomes very, very pertinent in the UN context where the Millennium Development Goals are coming to an end in 2015 and being replaced by the SDGs and building towards a post-2015 agenda. And at IEO, we are celebrating this year to raise awareness on evaluation and sharing knowledge and lessons. And I'd invite you in a few weeks to go onto our website, the first evaluation of the Millennium Develop of, of the, uh, the the MDGs has been conducted by the IEO, and I think you'll find it very interesting reading because it really covers a period of 20 years. You'll find the evaluation, you'll find the management response, and it clearly uh, indicates both the strengths and weaknesses of uh, an important global agenda that really has helped to advance development. Uh, I'll go through a few issues by describing the UNDP, what the evaluation is getting straight to principles, data collection methods, which I'm sure you spend a lot of time engaging with, looking at some of the challenges in evaluation. A key point is the shift from EO to IEO. What does it mean to move from an evaluation office, which is generally viewed as an extension or a part of management, to an independent evaluation office, which is now in the domain of oversight 
and supersedes management and actually evaluates and assesses management. And that, of course, means that you need to be reporting to a higher entity, which in the case of the, uh, my office is the board, the executive board, which represents the 177 countries. And of course, there's challenges around that because there's always a tension between uh, what one uh, uh, knows and what one says. And then we will look at future of evaluation and some insights from emerging evaluators. Now, you know about the UNDP, it's a global development network, and in the last year the budget is $10 billion. So the office that I head evaluates the $10 billion to see whether it's adding any value or not. And as you can understand, the stakes are high, because we do so at a global level and we also do at a country level. So in, every, in any year, we are in about 12 to 13 countries doing country-level evaluation, an average program size of $50 million. And we assess it over a timeline of four years or eight years. Uh, I'd invite you once again to look at an evaluation which we're particularly proud of. That's the evaluation of Af Afghanistan, which is the largest UNDP program. And uh, you will find that it has pointed out to various areas of both strength and weakness as in a developing context. And of course, the areas that UNDP works in is sustainable development pathways, inclusive and effective democratic governance, and resilience building, very much like the Fletcher School, which also looks at the issue of uh, post-conflict and peacekeeping. And what does this mean? How do you get real-time, real-context information in order to bring about meaningful changes? Now, the vision of UNDP, and this is what we assess the organization is, is to help countries achieve the simultaneous eradication of poverty and significant reduction of inequalities and exclusion. A very lofty, a very noble, a very worthy vision. The challenge, of course, is when you, as evaluators, concretizing this vision in how do you measure now whether all these things do happen? And how do you aggregate from the level of the country to the regional, to the sub-regional, to the global, and make meaning of it? So there's a big question of aggregation that all evaluators are challenged with. And I don't think we've got it right as a profession. Because uh, whilst we have the technical expertise and skills, we need to still ask the question, what constitutes good practice, weak practice, or no practice? Because a lot of the interventions by development agencies, not just the UNDP, the, the other 30 or 40, are not necessarily measure, measurable in tangible terms, but they are important. So how do you measure, in some form that is credible, what may not from a classical quantitative point of view, be able to be given a number, and, and, and what does this mean? So we're again in the, in the whole realm of the qualitative, quantitative debate. And what does this mean to deal with the both fields of data? You know, when does information become intelligence, and when is the intelligence valued, and when is it significant, is the biggest challenge, of course, we have. Now, UNDP, it views evaluation as critical to advance human development, and in its favor, 80% of the recommendations that are made are acted upon. Uh, we're going to get more rigorous on the process to, to be able to measure this. And it has a dual purpose to achieve greater accountability and improve learning. I quite often hear people saying, don't worry about accountability, focus on learning. The challenge is you cannot measure learning. You can measure accountability. And you cannot have learning if you don't have impartial information. So independence becomes critical so that you have impartial information in order to learn. Otherwise, you're learning the wrong thing because you're learning about the wrong thing, which is not critical. And of course, the policy is it's governed by an evaluation policy, which is currently under review. And the office reports to the executive board, I spoke about the oversight, on the function, compliance, coverage, findings, and follow-up of evaluations conducted by UNDP. So last year, we had the first comprehensive uh, consolidated annual report on evaluation, which is on the website which got 200 hyperlinks that go straight to the reports and straight to the videos so you can actually play around with it and it'll take you exactly to, to, to demonstrate where we've worked uh, across the globe. The office that I have the pleasure of heading right now has worked in 95 countries just doing country level evaluation. It's done a lot more than that in other places. So it moves from uh, like we were in Malaysia and uh, uh, recently and Uruguay to Zimbabwe where we're going to be and Kenya, etc. It covers the globe and we see the coverage. Now, the office, the issue of independence, internal, external. Uh, structurally and operationally, it's independent. It's an independent office, reports directly to the board. It approves the budget, work plan, and receives evaluation. To ensure that the director is not under influence, he or she may not work for more than two terms. 
and thereafter is barred from working in the organization. So that's to prevent what's called conflict of interest. Because if you have any aspiration of remaining in the organization, you're likely to be sweet. <laughs> um, and if you know you're going to leave, you're likely to say it as it is. Um, but of course, the person also has, he or she has full responsibility for HR, final decision on, on posting, budget, and evaluation process, and the final word on all content. So all reports are signed, uh, signed off uh, in his or her name. And I've been quite fortunate to inherit an office that already was of good standing, run by Saraswati Menon, who was the director for eight years, and actually developed the current policy. And I'm now in the process of enhancing the current policy to take it to the next level. So from an independence point of view, we have no, uh, no problems. There's certain issues we just need to codify. But it's also staffed by international professionals. We have 18 countries represented in, in the office. Uh, quite interesting when we have staff meetings, it's like mind your language. Um, it operates along unique norms and standards, which are the guiding principles, the key ones being independence, credibility, utility, the ICU. In South Africa, it was called the, the uh, uh, we, we had other terms for it, but the fundamental issue of the, the independence and credibility and utility is that you can, no one's going to take you seriously if, they, if you're not credible. And you're highly unlikely to be credible if you're perceived to be biased. So it goes back to the issue of bias and levels of objectivity. And independence to me and to my office and to the evaluation world is fundamental if you want to have an accountability dimension. If you're having a learning dimension, then it's fine. You can report to management. But it's a different type of piece altogether. And of course, we're also members of the OECD DAC network. Uh, the director is the vice chair of the United Nations Evaluation Group, which focuses on three critical areas. The first one is professionalization, you. When do you know that an evaluator is certified and can be used? And the UN is weak in this regard, because it does not have an adequately developed cadre of evaluators, a professional class. So we're working on that. In other, in other words, to work out what you mean by minimum competencies. I know in terms of Canada, uh, you apply and you become a certified evaluator. In some evaluation associations like Japan, you apply to be a member. In other cases, you just become a member. So there's high variability in this regard. And the question is, who governs the profession? Uh, in my uh, 20 years, I've watched in various parts of the world, in South Africa included, where someone comes in, they get a very high position in a short period of time, and then they make these profound statements about great judgment but without evidence or knowledge or understanding. And that is damaging to the profession. Sure, you need to be independent, you need to be, speak truth to power, but you need to do so from a basis that is absolutely solid. So that's the first area, professionalization. And of course, the International Program for Development Evaluation Training, where I uh, serve as a visiting faculty, is training evaluators. They've done something like 2,000 over 15 years, and it's about getting a curricula, a methodology, so people understand not just the technical aspects, but also the the professional, uh, the, 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 the political aspects of it. The second element is who evaluates the evaluator. Can the director of evaluation be evaluated by the evaluant? No. There's a conflict of interest. So in order to deal with that, you need to have what's called peer reviews. Other evaluators evaluate you. And uh, when I joined the office three years ago, the first thing I asked was for a peer review. It's always easy to do when you just join, so someone else's uh, you know, problem. And they came up with issues which needed to be ad addressed, and we addressed it. But now I serve as a peer reviewer of other agencies. So I just finished UN Women. And all these reviews of the evaluation offices is on the UN UNIC website. And they're more critical than you possibly can get. Because the evaluators are, uh, by nature, pessimistic and critical, you'll find. <laughs> and of course, the, you, you got the, the peer review element. And the third area is norms and standards. In other words, what are the frameworks within which one operates? What do you mean by independence? Is it absolute? Is it relative? Are there degrees to it? Is there variation? How does it affect the reporting lines, etc.? And uh, if you go on to the, the latest newsletter and website, you'll see there's a lot of debate on that fundamental issue. How we work, um, this is practically what we do. In any year, we in 15 countries, we do about five thematics. We're very busy. We're all over the globe at any one time. And as an office of independent professional evaluators, I recruit people on the basis of their professional competency and their experience, how many evaluations they conducted, were they independent or were they just reviews, right? I want the people that really have the gravitas to do this work because it's, 
It's politically uh, tense work because the context we work in are often dangerous. Uh, we'll lead all evaluations, so we lead it to ensure consistency of approach with the use of service providers at global and country level to build, to build skills. <coughs> so the model we use now is not to fly in someone from a remote context who gets an interpreter to come and do an evaluation because someone says it's independent if you've got someone from one part of the world. That's a misnomer. The model we use is to get people from the country. But largely I've been looking at academic institutions because they have the rigor in terms of dealing with data. So uh, just coming back from Tanzania two weeks ago, we used a university grouping that went out and conducted the interviews, etc. And then they also have a gravitas when they present the results in the country. Of course, we take final responsibility for content, but we have to use in terms of the field work. It normally takes about 10 months to do a country level evaluation because when you walk into these developing countries, everyone wants to talk to you and tell you their perspective. So it's a very multi-stakeholder perspective <coughs> and you've got to be, a, be very patient. And then you begin to realize the, 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 the challenge you have is the, the lack of data. But also we emphasize appropriate methods. We seek high level of beneficiary feedback. Government, stakeholders, donors, civil society, everyone is there all the time. Uh, another way, how do you get independence? You get it through a high level of engagement throughout the evaluation process to ensure buy-in and quality assurance. The argument that it is independent because you have an individual is a misnomer. It's independent because someone was hired by someone to come and write a report. That's an individual view. It's not an independent view. Because such persons can be under pressure or bias. Independence comes from a transparent, credible process, which at the end of which, someone takes the call. And that's generally the director and the head. So it's got to be a process that it actually uh, can be replicated. Now, political realities are always pr present at multiple levels, which evaluators must address. You are negotiating a minefield. The moment you walk in, you say you're an evaluator, people get tense <coughs> because you're making a judgment. It affects them. They're worried. They're concerned. You can engage up to a point, but there's a great danger that you will get co-opted by noise. The, the, the strong voice shouts and screams, and then you feel you're obliged to do so. A real evaluator looks to use the evaluation for empowerment, tries and gets the silent voice, the one that's not talking, and that comes to your methods, to find out what really is happening. Because the people in power, in the bureaucracy, will always give a picture of how great they are doing. What really constitutes evidence is what happens on the ground. Has it made a difference? So your test of evidence is, you really are testing between the claim and the evidence. That's what evaluation is about. The test between the claim and the evidence, and that is the tension that comes about. Now, the three levels at which we work, I'll go through very quickly. We do thematic, and these are the topics, gender, anti-corruption, disability, inclusive development, post-crisis response, mine action, protected <coughs> areas, institutional effectiveness with audit. I've just formed a partnership with the director of audit. We're doing the first ever evaluation audit combination on UNDP, which is looking at institutional effectiveness, because we are close. And I know the auditors believe they have a certain uh, reservoir of skills, but so do we. And I think this can be quite powerful. It's probably one of the first uh, in, in, in terms of the UN international system. But the work that we also do at the programmatic level, if you, um, what's it? If you aggregate and, and metasynthesize, you're talking about development results, the country level, but also global and regional programs. There's five regions and the global, what is it saying about the areas of intervention? South-South Strategic Plan 2014 to 2017, which we're doing, we did the last strategic plan. Once again, it, uh, credit to UNDP management. The strategic plan evaluation, the last one, they took every recommendation and that informed the new strategic plan. So it had a very high uptake in terms of action on recommendations. People may have concerns while we're going through the process. What really counts is what do people do when the results come? And that's where it has an extremely high uptake. And the reason for that is the board checks and we also check. So it is a learning organization in that regard. <coughs> Independence, credibility, utility, I cannot emphasize this enough. Ethical standards, technical rigor, integrity, fundamental. Professionalization, fundamental. But ethical standards, even more fundamental. There's two levels at which it goes. You know, there's a level and there's a level. And evaluators come under pressure. Right? It'll be subtle. And one of the subtle and not so subtle issues, well, if this evaluation goes out, it's so negative, we're going to lose all our funding. You'll hear that. People are going to lose. 
And that is the area that you need to think. So you've got to make a decision whether you're going to provide evidence or you're going to play the political game in terms of being nice to certain parties or not. The fundamental view that we take in IEO is beneficiaries have to benefit. So let's measure the perspective of results from the perspective of the beneficiary. That's the lens in which you use. If you measure it from another lens, then you're likely to maintain the status quo. Methods. We do all of this, but each one of it is a challenge. Desk review, administrative data, meta-analysis of relevant evaluation, cybermetric analysis, surveys, key informant interviews. And the challenge we have is how do we use this in a way that it is mixed methods to get multiple perspectives but not mixed up. Right. Because sometimes mixed methods means anything, you just take it and put it in and think. Because there's always decisions that you make. You make choices as an evaluator. And the choices that you make could fundamentally shift the results, depending on the questions you ask, how you pose them and how you use them, what you emphasize. And you need to, be, to recognize we are not perfect, we are not totally objective, we need to be very aware of our own prejudices and biases which we all have. Evaluators are not gods, they need to do their work with conviction but a great amount of humility. Challenges. We work across the world. Hard to cover. The context, you all work on this. Large countries in conflict to small side income state, hard to standardize. It took us a long way to get into Afghanistan to do the evaluation. It took us even longer to get to the remote areas where the programs were. And there were conflicts and challenges. So sometimes the long. The bigger challenge, of course, is by the time you finish an evaluation, the world may have changed. So you've got to work with speed but also thoroughly. And that's happened in many cases. Then it becomes a part of the archive in the library. Integration with UN. Adopt broader UN frameworks. Who is accountable? Engagement goes beyond the projects. Advocacy convening. Limited coverage of high quality decentralized evaluation. Most evaluations in UNDP, some 300, happen at the decentralized level. But it uses a contracting out, out model. Consultants get the job and they do it. And right now, that is being looked at. We were doing the quality assurance. Read the policy review, which reflected that there was a problem with the system. And now how do you fix the system in this way that works? This is the part that you would have the greatest challenge. It's a challenge to aggregate results in a large and complex organization, given measurement biases. Self-reporting is always positive. It needs, which is fine, but it needs to be validated. Okay. And it needs to be validated independently. So the work that we do with the Independent Evaluation Office, we look at the self-reporting, we consider it, but finally we make the call, which means that the cost of our evaluations goes up because you're often doing primary data collection when you should not be doing so. And the, the tension you need to look at in terms of evaluation is the issue of the, the budget. Weak national data, often not reliable or out of date. I'll invite you to also read the next evaluation that should be out in a few weeks, Sasha, which is the Human Development Report part, in how do, the, how do the computation take place, and we make some points in terms of data. Key shifts. Independence is not about positioning, to say, I am independent, so what? You're independent but irrelevant because you may be totally cut off. <laughs> but about transparent processes that engage broadly. You have to be independent for credibility, but you need to engage and engage and engage, not to alienate and cut yourself out, but still maintain it. It's a ensure credibility and trust from stakeholders. The first question I get asked when I'm in a country, who do you report to? Personally, I get asked all the time by government. And I say the executive board. And when they are convinced of my credentials, then they talk to me. And that's exactly the issue you will have, because as long as you come from the organization, you're perceived as internal. So having the word independent helps, but you still need to demonstrate that you are indeed impartial. That is the issue. Okay. Standardized approaches, new approach to management responses. We now include the, we present the report and management comes in and they give the, the response. We engage with government counterparts to lead to the utility. We have an advisory panel which consists of 11 members currently. So the big names in evaluation I have on my advisory panel, their job is to critique my work and to advise. And on the basis of that, you accelerate issues because you cannot go and buy 50 years of experience in, a, in an office that we have. 
And when you look at the members that we have there, it is the who's who in evaluation. It helps a lot. Future of evaluation, key issue, data revolution. Donors are demanding more data. You've got high speed access to, access to data, but poor quality data. More info doesn't mean better quality. Evaluation is a reflective process, and information is not equal to intelligence. Okay. Evaluators need to be critical when dealing with the avalanche of data. Key message. Real time. The world is moving very fast. Quite often you need to move fast. Real time evaluation. What does it mean? And of course there's a methodology around it. Role of evaluators. You need to embrace a multidisciplinary and multi-perspective approach. All of us come from a particular discipline. My primary training is as a geographer. But having come into the evaluation world, I had to learn other fields. Because we always have limitation because of our specialty. It's important, but it's a limitation. And of course, there's a call for joint work, peer-to-peer -peer learning, data visualization, national ownership, and capacity. Finally, insights for you, emerging evaluators. Build your data mining skills. Critical. It's a platform. Build your other skills. Interview, management, creating questionnaire. You need to be technically astute. Find an ME mentor and seek internships. Most UN evaluation officers offer internship. They pay little, but go in, <laughs> get it, right? Because it'll show well on your resume. When I interview, and I do it all the time, <coughs> I look for experience, unfortunately. And I look for the person that went and worked for nothing, because it shows they really are, they're serious about this work. Join an evaluation association. I've had some people that <coughs> have come in and apply for posts, and then they haven't heard of an evaluation association. They definitely didn't get a job with me. Because it shows when you take out your own funds and you, you, you invest, it shows your, your, your seriousness about it. You've read the journals, you know the literature. Know your evaluant. Development, health, policy, academia, research, science, climate change, etc. Find your niche. You're not going to be able to evaluate everything. But since the world is so broad and there's so many areas, you will find your niche. Specialize. Know your content and your technical skills. The growth of M&E pro, uh, &E profession is astronomical. Pick up a newspaper, you'll see it. Some interesting organizations that employ professionals, Lego, British Council, US Justice, etc., private sector. So it was government, it's the UN, international agencies, now it's the private sector. You're in the right area. In the development context, need to be willing to go to the field. If you work in the UN, you need to go into the field. So most of the staff in my office spend a lot of time out in remote areas uh, doing evaluation. It's, it's challenging, it's complex, but you get good experience. And of course there's 43 agencies and there's many places in which you can work. I'll stop there. I think I went over time, but I'll take questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Nader. You covered so many critical areas and it'll be interesting to see where the conversation goes. We can talk about speaking truth to power and the linked independence and what that actually means and what type of pushbacks you've gotten. We can talk about how do you actually sense make. There's data and there's intelligence, and the process of sense making um, can be take different forms if you have an accountability versus a learning agenda. And so we could talk about we can talk about that. We can talk about if we're all pessimists and, and cynics and critics, or we, we can talk about if we're probing and curious and actually <laughs> aligned to creating value for the programs and what some of your challenges are around creating value for the program versus simply reporting reporting data. And there's so many more interesting things and themes that have come up from this conversation. Um, I'll remind our virtual participants, please shut off your mics because we can periodically hear people breathing and shuffling papers and sniffling. So please shut off your mics and chat in any question that you do have because we will ask it in the forum. Um, we have a mic for those who are here. Um, and so if, can I just see a show of hands of who, what questions, what questions we have? Okay, so to make our microphone person work really hard, we're going to start at the back and then we're going to come to the front. Please stand and introduce yourself um, and then ask your question and Brad, it'll be here next. Um, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you Dr. Naidu for being here with us. It's really interesting to hear your perspectives. My name is Juan Taborda. I'm a first year PhD student here at the Fletcher School. So my question is, I was working before with the government usually with local agents back in Colombia where I am from. And one of their main concerns was evaluations were growing and they didn't have the capabilities to deal with them. So how do you answer to, to that type of concerns? People saying, 
well, you know, I have two or three persons in staff, and I have to answer to donors' evaluations, government evaluations, independent evaluations. So more and more evaluations are happening, and usually we are relying on data from those very local level municipalities that mainly don't have the capabilities to do it or the knowledge. So how would you answer? Thank you very much. Do you want to take a few? Absol okay, sure. absolutely. Kirsten, here at the here at the front, and you'll get a get a mic. Hi, um, thank you so much again for speaking with us today. I think a lot of us, um, I think I speak for a lot of us when I say we've learned a lot um, from your talk so far. Um, my name is Kirsten Zeider. I'm a first year student. I've taken the um, DME series here at Fletcher, and my question is about the um, independence of the evaluation office at UNDP. You mentioned that there are some challenges associated, particularly with the fact that you then play an oversight role, which may supersede management. Um, can you speak a little bit more about those challenges that you may have faced um, with that dynamic at UNDP? Thank you. Another super interesting question. And we, let's go with Betty right there, and then we'll, we'll answer after these three, and then we'll get another three. Okay, great. Um, hi, thank you again. Um, I'm also a first year student. My name is Betty Cox. I'm in the master's program, and I'm taking Professor Church's dm &E series and design monitoring evaluation series. And in our current class in advanced evaluation, we're talking a little bit about evaluation capacity building for organizations. And you spoke about the professionalization, um, particularly within UNDP. Um, and I'm interested in some of the key learnings and maybe challenges you faced in terms of building institutional capacity for evaluation and how we can translate those as young professionals to sort of our um, professional experiences. Thank you. Three great questions. Let's respond to those, and then we'll pick up some more. Sounds like parliamentary time. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. The first question, in terms of the uh, the absorptive capability of the organisation when there's multiple evaluations, is a critical one. And all organisations say we're so busy doing other things, we're doing the work, and now you want us to respond to this copious evaluation. We don't have the skills or the time. There are too many recommendations, and you know we want to do the work. So they'll keep bringing the issue of implementation is more important than reflection. And it's hard to win that one, because implementation is important. Whether it's more important than reflection is a, second, is a secondary question, because if you're implementing wrongly, you continue to do so. But it's very difficult to get uh, organizations with limited resources, with high political and administrative pressure, to pause and reflect. We have the luxury as evaluators to look at other people's work and talk about it. But most people are working. So in that position, it, 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 it's an absolute challenge. And often the push for multiple evaluations comes from the funders, because they need to tell the capital an evaluation has been conducted. It's almost administrative. So you need a very strong evaluation head to challenge these people. And you may or may not be successful to really say, do fewer evaluations that are more strategic and that add value. The second issue on the same part is often the evaluations that are imposed, as I would use the word. In other words, they top down, they are to meet some funding request, uh, some funding demand to a constituency that is quite distant from the country, ask questions that are not relevant to the country, right? And almost in, a, in, in uh, and uses a, a parachute model of bringing someone in from outside with that perspective to look at it and to come up with a judgment. And these evaluations are terribly disempowering to the country, extremely disempowering. Uh, in my experience in South Africa, when I was uh, running the monitoring and evaluation directed in land affairs in 1995, we also had the model because there was very little in, uh, evaluation capacity where the donors were sending so-called experts to come in with limited time and tell us how to do it. But knowing South Africa, they said quite strongly, we don't want you to do it this way. We will have it our way. Keep the funding if this is what comes. And I was part of that. And hence, we really believed and we implemented the issue of national and true ownership. Because to get learning and integration, you need to own the process and own the results. Otherwise, it's always distant and it's always punitive. Um, and that's a big, big question. But it needs strong evaluation heads. But often, because of the unequal relation of power, the imbalance, the people that give the funding call the shots. And how you negotiate that is, is an issue. So they will say anything. Give us the money. You want an evaluation? Sure. Please give us the, uh, the money. And then when the evaluation comes, it's a challenge. There's been many damaging and poor quality evaluations internationally that have come through in the name of the incredible. Second question on, so the, 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 the first part, the tension between what's mandatory and required because it's a part of a funding proposal 
and what is strategic needs to be negotiated at a leadership level. To say, if this is mandatory, let's, let's talk. What are the terms of reference? What are the rules of engagement? And it's, it's difficult, but it's getting better as countries become more confident to do so. And if you look at the profile of IPTED, I've been there for six, seven years teaching now. It's changed from largely northern participants to now largely southern participants, which indicates the willingness of government to begin to own the evaluation processes, to use evaluation for a process of empowerment and not a process of subjugation, put it as strongly as that. Secondly, the issue of independence. If you are an independent evaluation office, you are implicitly evaluating management decisions. And that will always create tension. But that is normal with the game, with, with, the, with the process. Now, in the UN system of the 43 agencies in the, in the UNEC, there's probably four evaluation, independent evaluation offices. There's the JEF uh, office, there's the IFAD, there's the IEO, which, are, which report to the board. And we are in that situation. So there'll be a lot more tension. But it's not tension that is destructive, it's tension that's creative. Because when all is said and done, the fact that the management takes the recommendations and largely acts on them indicates a managerial and leadership maturity. And I have actually witnessed that in, 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 in UND, on, on, on most of the areas of, of work. So it goes back to what I've been challenging internationally, the notion of independence, which many believe is when you use a consultant, it's independent. And I say no. It is an individual, not independent. Both it has the I, but it's different. <laughs> and that hasn't gone down too well when I first started for, uh, three years ago, when people were saying, you know, Indra, you change the model, what's going on? You're going to lose your independence. And I said, why? They said, well, when we have consultants, they're independent. No, the individuals. Someone pays them. And there's always the issue of you get paid when you put a report in a certain way. And there's agenda. So that notion that it's truly independent because it's an individual is a notion that is largely dispelled a lot in the developing world and in the evaluation community. The fact that you're moving to a professional model, most governments in the south where I work now have professional, protected, independent evaluation offices. The training is moving in that direction. It's now a profession like audit. means the world has changed. And those who still believe that is what independence is and that is what credibility is really need to re-question. Uh, the, the, the assumptions. And if, if I can hop in, if you were the management of UNDP, how would you maybe respond to that question differently if you had to wear that hat? The, um, if you were the management of UNDP, mm. how would they argue, what would they be, what would their arguments be that you should be reporting to them rather than the board? Well, then it's another form, it's a form of learning and it's not uh, credible, it's not credibility. But as long as the board is the one that funds the organization, uh, and a prerequisite of funding is independent evaluation. I think that relationship is pretty much established. In fact, globally, not just with the, with the UN agencies, also with the, uh, the, 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 the IFIs, the International Financial Institutions, there's about 10 or 12 of them. They have, most of them are independent, and it links to the, to, to the funding issue. So UNDP <coughs> is very advanced in having uh, a very independent evaluation office in that regard. It creates tensions, but it also brings about credibility. Because for management, for when an office gives a compliment that's independent, it means something. You know, of course, it's often giving critique. That's a, that's a separate issue on it. So that would be the, be the response. Um, so I've spoken about independence you know, quite broadly. And, and I'm going, I've been quite consistent in my, my talk on what constitutes independence. And as you can imagine, the challenge is often in the people who followed the model that it's a, you contract someone, therefore you got the job done. We know that is not, that is not true. The third part is um, capacity building and evaluation. It's a long, challenging, slow process. Because the problem of the evaluation profession, it has not established what are the criteria to be an evaluator, except the Canadian model, which is really quite good. And when we assess, we use a competency framework, which is a combination of qualifications, the minimum is the master's degree, and experience. So, where evaluation probably differs from research, you need research skills, but evaluation differs in that it's action-oriented. And there's a political dimension to how you use what you have researched in a, simple, in a simple way. And that means having a good managerial and organizational understanding that makes you make the shift. So, so that's the part. How well it's doing? Poorly. It's, it's, it's weak. And part of the reason is the fact that we don't have an occupational cadre of professional evaluators 
at different levels is and does remain a challenge. Because if you do, you can have these people moving around the system. And one of the biggest challenges we have, when we recruit, we recruit from the same pool. So people just move within agencies because there's so few of the, the people that we have. Okay. I'm sure we have many more questions. So I've asked Brad to move to this side. We'll maybe go, we'll go right here, Eric and Stephanie, and then I think we have a virtual question. Hi, my name is Eric Jospi. I'm a second year <clears throat> master's student, also taking Professor at Church's DME series. A few weeks ago in class, we were talking about learning in organizations. We made the distinction between single loop learning, which is when you improve the processes or the implementation of the programs you're trying to accomplish, versus double loop learning, which is when you rethink the assumptions that were built into the design and challenge and rethink of what you're trying to do in the first place. Can you give one or two examples of when evaluations that UNP has conducted has managed to uh, affect double loop learning in, at any level in the organization? Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Nadu. Um, I'm wondering about UNDEP's approach to evaluating soft development issues like governance, uh, which is one of the things that you have listed on one of your slides. Because especially when you're looking at issues like accountability, you have multiple levels there. You have accountability to international standards, um, national government priorities, which is a big issue within the United Nations, and also at the individual level, trying to improve the lives of citizens. So how do you address all these different levels of accountability in providing recommendations on soft development issues? And then kind of going into Eric's question as well, how do you frame these recommendations so that you can perhaps promote double loop learning if an evaluation finds that you, an approach is perhaps less effective? Super. And we have our, our third and our virtual question and then <coughs> get some answers. Uh, thank you for the uh, for the presentation. We have a question from a recent Fletcher alumni that's currently working in the UNICEF Nepal office, actually. Um, who uh, June Kim is wondering about RCT-based evaluations, and um, they see RCTs becoming more of a trend rather than a single method, and is wondering about how you evaluate or perceive the emerging or re-emerging trend of RCTs um, in the United Nations system. Sure. Okay, I'll. learning, uh, single or double loop. Most of the evaluations do not go to a level of sophistication where they address the double loop. They just talk about incremental change that can happen in the single. And part of the reason for that <coughs> is before a program is designed and implemented, there's a lot of political negotiation that goes around it. So when you're moving to the double loop, which means re-looking at the assumptions, it means going back into that arena of renegotiating. And in most cases, there's a resistance to it. So the changes that evaluators bring about often are very modest and small. <coughs> They're incremental. But collectively, I'd like to believe that it brings about a big change in the, in, in, in the future. I think it's highly unlikely that you're going to have an evaluation that is so uh, earth-shattering that it leads to a complete program redesign, reorganization, and, and repitching. And we need to recognize that we're not the only stream of information that influences management and governance. There's multiple other sources, audit, uh, political pressures, etc., that also come to, to bear on the, uh, on the change. Life is not so simple that you have an evaluation and, the business, and everything comes and it changes. We as evaluators feel what's wrong with them. They're not listening to us. We're clever. We're enlightened. We're giving them data. Why don't they think rationally? But thinking is never rational. It's political. It's, it's, it, it goes through multiple shades. And you realize that as you get older as an evaluator. I wish I had this wisdom 20 years ago when I started doing evaluation of the South African Land Reform Program and wondered why they didn't listen to me when I was saying that the program just got it wrong. Because they were using a uh, willing seller, willing buyer model in 1995, assuming that they would change and move uh, a 80-20 uh, land redistribution through the market. And within three years, we found it to be a failure, my little office which didn't go down very well because it had political ramifications. Uh, but there was a political change, and then the new minister was very happy with what I was saying. So it also feeds into who's in charge at the time. But it was a model that was imposed. It was a model that was acontextual, and it did not work, and our data said it would not work. And the most fascinating thing was we did what was called a beneficiary assessment. 
So yeah, I went, uh, went out in the country, in the rural areas where I spent most of my life, looking for the beneficiaries. They couldn't find them. They didn't exist. So programs often are programs in abstract, but they're not in concrete. And evaluators need to talk to that. The second question is complexity. Um, how do you evaluate the soft issues of governance? Extremely difficult. I have brought in my evaluation advisory panel to help me come up with a methodology to deconstruct these realities where you've got soft issues, where you've got multiple actors and multiple agencies intervening in a particular context, and how do you tease out or delineate the particular contribution of UNDP in this and who is really the, the issue, which is the big issue of, of attribution and contribution. So I don't have an answer now. When I get my advisory panel, who have spent decades writing books and all on the subject, uh, I'm sure they will help to come up with a methodology to, in a more meaningful way, uh, be able to measure the non-tangibles but important. And we need to be honest as evaluators, we're really not that good in, in certain areas. Uh, I had an advisor uh, two decades ago and who advised badly, but one thing I did remember well <laughs> was he said to me, and he kept on going on about his 30 or 40 years of experience, uh, came from a northern country, and that was the thing. And he says, if you cannot measure it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> and we rejected it. He was a product of the quantitative revolution. Uh, we dispatched him quite soon thereafter uh, because there was no meaning added because land reform was not simply about moving hectares. It was about people getting their rights and feeling good about the fact that a transition took place. So measuring the non-tangibles. Um, so that's the, the part. And of course the double loop part comes in. in so do look at our website and we are coming up with thought pieces on that. We are really trying to move the frontiers in, in, in terms of methodology. Uh, there's good work that's been done by uh, Elliot Stern, very good work by uh, Thomas Schwantz, who looks at the whole question of discourse and, and, and unpacking this, this area. It's fascinating work. It's really exciting. But after you get excited, practically what does it mean for an evaluator? That's where we are stuck right now. RCTs, the last question on impact evaluation. There's a lot of debate around this. I was part of that uh, Noni network years ago when I was in the country. In certain context. But the context largely was very much, again, quantitative. And the fact that you could take methodologies that uh, were applicable in, in the health sciences and sort of superimpose it to demonstrate whether there's been an impact or not. You speak to most governments, they really are not interested in a lot of money being spent to answer a simple question, has the education system had an impact or not? They want real time, they want quick information. There's other methods to ascertain whether something has an impact or not. And I think the work of uh, 3IE, the, uh, the work that's being done now, remember there's been lots of changes in this whole RCT, uh, random stars, et cetera, is moving more to a way that you can use multiple methods in order to uh, come to close to what you mean by attribution, contribution, and impact. So in a way, it was a methodological fetish at the time. There was a lot of money thrown into it, so it became a theme. But just as it rose, it has fallen. And now we have other ways in which to, you know, to look at these issues. Um, I think it's important that we are constantly challenged in terms of methodology. I think we need to look at the issue of impact. But do recognize development is not easy to measure as you would measure making motor vehicles. And as long as you take that into account, that it is a circuitous process that's complex, that's dynamic, and some of the methodology in terms of impact assumes everything is linear, you would recognize that some methods are quite frankly not worth pursuing. It's better to use much quicker, real-time evaluative methodologies in order to get to a result that comes, it's not perfect, but no one knows whether it's perfect or not, and, and, and it comes to the point. I'll stop on that. Thanks. I think we should say thank you to Dr. Thank you for all our virtual participants. Thank you for everyone who came and the great questions. I'm sure we could ask another hour more, but we do need to vacate the room. I just want to flag that the next talk in the Career and &E series here at Fletcher is actually with the Director of Evaluation from UN Women, and that's next week. So I hope to see many of you in that conversation as well. Thank you, and once again, thank you so thank much. You very much. Okay. Thank you.